So waiting for a yell to, to be sent, uh, there is a, a second poll, uh, right, where we can comment the, actually the, uh, the, the results. So uh, uh, for 75% of attendees here, uh, it's your first EPI date so far, right? So uh, yeah, welcome, uh, welcome. And please know that we have online events, but we in soon we hope we will have physical events. Uh, they are coming back. This is why we kept the name of e each event, right? So uh, Eyal is here. Uh, coming on stage. Hello, Eyal. How are you? Hi. Uh, great to see you again, Maddie. Yeah, great to see you again. Uh, yeah, the stage is yours for 25 minutes for the Global State of Union, right? Great. Yep. Uh, global State of the Union for Open Banking. Let me uh, see if I can bring up my deck. Should only take a minute. No. I've never used this platform before, so hopefully it's not too fidgety. Yeah, that, that's, okay. that's always a challenge. It's the third button below, before, yeah. uh, below the... I think... Uh, I think that sure. ought to do it, right? So, yeah. I'm not sure how does that. Oh, and I can see in the window what everybody else sees. Wonderful. Wonderful. The stage is yours. See you in 25 okay. minutes. Great. Thanks, Mary. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can, uh, you can see my screen okay. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is A.L. Savan. I did an IT for uh, about 25 years. The last 15 of that was with a major bank where I led the integration practice. Uh, but earlier this year, I decided to leave. And the reason I decided to leave is because I, I fell in love. I fell in love with something called uh, open banking. And I decided that I wanted to dedicate my career to open banking. Um, so uh, on good terms, I uh, left the, the large bank and uh, decided to start an open banking podcast under the name Mr. Open Banking. I invite you to listen to it. It's the only podcast dedicated to open banking out there. Um, and uh, more recently than that, I joined Axway as their head of open banking, uh, where I'm helping Axway sharpen our uh, focus on that space. Today, I'm here to talk to you about the global state of the union. How is open banking doing around the world? I've only got 25 minutes, so it's going to be a bit of a bit of a whirlwind tour. And I look forward to your questions at the end. Global state of the union. This. It's really intended to give you an idea of how open banking is doing. And I'm going to focus on really 2020, as you'll see. Um, I could go right back into the history, go all the way back to PSD2, but you've probably seen a lot of presentations like that. So instead, I'm going to focus on uh, current events and hopefully give you a good idea of what's going on. Um, so it helps to start with a definition. Uh, what exactly is open banking? And I apologize to those of you who have a very clear definition in your head, but what I find out there is that even though this is a seemingly simple question, uh, it really is something that you find inconsistent answers to um, all over the world. And I, I think it helps to frame it for the rest of our discussion. So all the way on the left in this simple diagram, what you see here is what you could call a partner bank, right? The, the idea that I have APIs and I leave the four walls of my bank. I connect to Visa, I connect to TSIS so that I can process transactions, I connect to, say, SWIFT. But all of those associations required you to sit down with that third party and ink some sort of a deal and then run a project to integrate your systems. That is nowhere near open banking. So banks that say, look, I connect to Visa, therefore I do open banking, fundamentally misunderstand what it is. The second stage is closer. This is when you have a developer portal, when a bank says, hey, uh, I've got open APIs. I've published them in some place that a third party can come sight unseen without, without signing a contract and start using my APIs to connect to my systems. This is far, far better and gives you much more scale and is much closer to open banking than partner banking or B2B. However, it is not open banking, at least by my definition. And the reason it is not is because it is not based on an open standard. Real open banking only happens when you agree on a common open standard for the entire ecosystem. And that is the journey that the world is currently on, as you'll see. That middle part uh, is pretty good. And really, in regions that don't have any open banking regulation or any kind of spec that an industry consortium has agreed on, you're sort of stuck with that middle box. Publish the best open APIs, create the best developer experience that you can. And, and that has often come to be called these days platform banking, where you're trying to create an open platform uh, where, well, sometimes closed, I guess, where developers can come and use your APIs to build new kinds of solutions. So by and large, as you'll see when we do the tour, the world is sort of caught between the middle picture and the one all the way on the right. So very few regions have a full-fledged 
uh, thriving open banking ecosystem because it's such a new idea. Um, many of them still look at this banking as a platform, as, as a stepping stone to get there. And that's really uh, borne out by the data. So the, the first thing that we can look at, if we consider that definition, is global banking platforms. So while open banking is a little you know, iffy on the definition, the notion of a global banking platform is pretty well understood, with banks really taking on this notion of building platforms as the norm, right? They, they uh, are happy to, to, to start opening up their APIs, at least the advanced ones, and publishing API products. And here you see a map of how that's going uh, all over the world. Um, note that this is Q1, and this is what I'd like to stress. This is Q1 of 2020, 197 total platforms uh, all over the world, uh, something in the neighborhood of 14, 1434, I have it written down in my, in my notes, uh, API products, which is to say APIs published. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Already we're at 197 globally. You'll notice that the regions in Europe, Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, and Russia are far and away uh, leading. Uh, and we'll talk about the correlation to regulations, why that might be happening. But the real standout here is, of course, Asia Pacific, who, while they aren't really uh, leading the pack in the platform numbers, they are absolutely crushing everybody when it comes to API products. And that's uh, very um, understandable given the number of innovative APIs you see coming out of the region and real working revenue models uh, coming out of that region. So all this to say that you're seeing a steady growth and all through 19, uh, 2019 rather, you saw a growth rate of between uh, 20 and 30% per quarter. But then something amazing happened. Um, and I wanna stress before we leave this slide as the bottom line says, a platform is regulated or otherwise. This statistic is not necessarily tied to the existence of open banking regulation. It leverages the previous definition that says, if you're building open APIs that invite third parties to build solutions, then you're effectively uh, feeding into this stat and, and moving towards open banking. So <clears throat> uh, let's take a look at more statistics that, that demonstrate that sort of correlation. Um, and a really astounding fact, and this is what I wanted to point out, this next slide you're gonna see is Q2 2020. Note the difference. We went from 197 uh, platforms globally in Q1 to 293 in Q2. That's a 50% growth. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, it's too much to say that's a direct correlation to the enforcement of open banking standards in various regions, adoption of standards in those regions. This is particularly borne out when you look at the API types that are published. Uh, accounts and payments, far ahead. No surprise, those are the two types of APIs that uh, are mandated by most open banking standards that are being adopted uh, all over the world. So you see this almost hockey stick level growth around the world in the growth of banking platforms, particularly uh, in the APIs that are focused on, on what is promoted by open banking standards and in many cases mandated by open banking standards. Um, uh, you'll note Europe, Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, Russia continue to extend their lead in Q1 while the laggards continue to uh, be laggards. Um, and uh, uh, again, that, that standout statistic there is, is the correlation to the regulated APIs being the ones that see the most growth. So in other words, platform adoption was happening. It was happening prior to the adoption of open banking standards at a pretty steady pace. But open banking came along and really put the foot on the gas and accelerated the process. Regulation uh, continues uh, around the world. So if, if we think about that, that correlation demonstrated by the previous slide of hockey stick growth as it relates to regulatory activity, um, no surprise, Europe's PSD2 led to an explosion of regulatory activity uh, all over the world. Um, in addition to uh, Europe and the UK, open banking regulations are now implemented for banking markets in India, in Singapore, Australia, Bahrain, Hong Kong, and South Korea. Uh, Brazil, Egypt, Indonesia, Mexico, and Japan are now in final stages of progressing towards uh, real implementations of open banking. Uh, we'll talk about later. Mexico issu issued their first license just recently. Uh, open banking regulations around the globe. Uh, what's, what's interesting, I should say, is open banking regulations around the globe are adopted for different reasons. So everybody is moving towards this similar goal, but they really adopt it uh, for different reasons. And those reasons are very much tied up into the culture of the country and the relationship to the existing banking regime. The majority of them focus on this notion of innovation and competition by opening up the market to, to many more players and, and uh, uh, allowing that competition to drive prices down and so on. And ultimately that leads to more innovative financial products. This is a pretty common theme 
uh, across open banking implementations all over the world. Uh, the other one that you see very, very often is transparency. It's a commonly stated goal. It, it's intended to move banks away from opaque pricing models where you don't know the spread and the fees are all hidden to ones that are more open. And you'll often see APIs that reflect that need for transparency, such as the, the read-write API uh, in the UK. But then you get a little more specific to region. Some like the UK and Israel notably specifically stipulate that this innovation should aim to improve outcomes for end customers. Others don't explicitly say that, but the UK and Israel do. They say this, is, this has to be customer focused and if customers are happy and, and making more money and, and you see a growth in the economy, that's a goal, an outright goal of the standard. Some have gone even further, Australia and New Zealand uh, focus on enabling this notion of data rights, they, they focus very heavily on this is about the customer owning their data and they have built that in to their regulation but that's pretty philosophically forward thinking um, but uh, watched very closely by the rest of the world because it's philosophically forward thinking um, the notion of security risk systemic security risk because of screen scraping is a key driver in some regions uh, notably brazil canada and the us so canada and the us uh, love to talk about how, well, look, the demand is there. People have signed up for these services. They just use poor technology to make them work, i.e. Uh, screen scraping and credential sharing. So they've put that at the center of their efforts to adopt open banking, removing that systemic risk. Um, and uh, the importance of interoperability across borders and between different stakeholders and different central banks uh, is more applicable uh, to regions like Europe, uh, India, and Japan, uh, less so for other places. The one you might have noticed I missed, uh, despite it being a secondary goal almost everywhere, um, because it's, it, it plays really well, the fact is only Egypt, Indonesia, Mexico, and Rwanda uh, specifically stipulate that the goal of open banking is to improve financial inclusion and target the unbanked. I'll stress again, in many uh, regions, this is a secondary goal. They, they definitely see the opportunity to open up banking to the long tail, uh, what they call the, the unbanked or the underserved. Um, but only in Egypt, Indonesia, Mexico, and Rwanda has this been specifically stated as a goal of the standard. So again, uh, the, the point here is regions may adopt open banking for different reasons, but they're all arriving at the same place. Um, and that same place is this notion of common standards. Okay, so there's a misconception in the open banking world that uh, when you say open banking, um, a colleague of mine uh, from FTX, uh, Don Cardinal, likes to say, uh, capital O, capital B versus lowercase O, lowercase B. There is this uh, automatic uh, thinking that says, well, you must be talking about capital O, capital B, which means you must be talking about regulation. But remember, open banking, strictly speaking, is just about the development of a common standard. It isn't about the development of uh, regulation per se. You can get to a common standard in different ways. So in practice, what you usually see is a blended model, and that's what this diagram is intended to uh, indicate. You see a blend of a government acting as a kind of catalyst and setting a timeline and, and setting broad goals. And sometimes these goals are fairly specific and sometimes they're looser. Uh, oftentimes, even within a regulated standard, you have voluntary aspects and mandatory aspects. So you'll see different regulatory bodies play with that needle and, and sort of move things around uh, depending on what makes sense for their region. Um, very often you see uh, the regulators say, okay, here's your timeline, here's your goal, but ultimately the standard will be developed by an industry-led consortium, which is to say privately. So for those out there who are saying, well, you don't want the government writing the spec, very rarely does the government actually write the spec. Uh, they set some goals and then they hand it off to some industry-led body like the Berlin Group in Europe or uh, Open Banking UK to yeah, actually... Yep. Yeah, sorry. Can you put your screen in uh, in full screen mode because we we you are not in presentation mode. We oh uh, yeah, okay. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Oh oh, sorry. I hope uh, here I'll I'll take everybody through the slides one more time in case you didn't see them. So that's your uh, global open banking platform slide. Uh, that's your uh, indication of growth between Q1 and Q2. Uh, I'll be happy to share these later, so uh, uh, you'll be able to uh, look at them at your leisure. Uh, this is the indication of state of regulation around the world. And finally, this is where we were in terms of common standards. So many different approaches to open banking. Um, like I said, uh, often what you see in practice is a blended approach between regulatory and industry-led and the emergence of industry-led consortiums. Depending on where you are, we talked about different regions having different goals. Uh, they'll swing the needle more towards industry-led or more towards regulated, but very rarely do you have a pure play, you know, it's only one or the other. It's not really an either or uh, in practice. And then finally, you have 
API standards extensions being introduced typically by solution vendors, sometimes people who are very large and ingrained in the existing system like Swift, sometimes startups who are introducing something new to the market. Uh, Open Bank Project uh, from Tessabee notably really went down this road long before there were any regulations and then started to incorporate their solution into the regulatory uh, regimes. So um, in reality, uh, open banking is happening across all of these different approaches. Okay, So I, this is important to stress because it isn't just capital O, capital B. There are many different approaches to open banking. There's many lowercase o, lowercase b. You'll notice that's my default lowercase uh, because it's important to stress that there's, there's different ways to get there. But the goal is the same. We're trying to get to this notion of, of open standards, the development of a common open standard for the financial services ecosystem. And to measure the success of open banking, uh, you really have to look at all of these activities holistically. Now, I could spend the rest of my time uh, taking you through uh, more statistics and, and world maps. But to be honest, I think um, there's a better way to get a sense of how open banking is doing. And that's to look at uh, something a little more fun top five lists, okay? So uh, the remainder of my slides are really top five lists of, of important stuff you should know that is happening out there um, that is really indicating the success of open banking and that we're clearly moving towards something like open banking uh, the world over. So let's begin. I wanna stress that this is 2020. I'm not gonna talk about Apple Card. I'm not gonna talk about Google checking accounts. I have limited my top five lists to 2020 events, which is pretty crazy because we're, uh, first of all, are going through this crisis that disrupted a lot, um, but also uh, the year's not over. So there's still a lot happening. Uh, even so, it was pretty easy to come up with top five uh, lists for a couple of uh, major categories. So let's start with acquisitions. This was huge news. Uh, opened up the year with a bang in January. On January uh, 13th, Visa announced that they would be buying aggregator plaid for $5.3 billion. Uh, a huge deal and uh, really the beginning of a sweep of acquisitions that you saw happening in the, in the fintech and uh, the sort of open banking slash aggregator kind of space. Uh, it took them a little while, but on June 23rd, MasterCard announced that they would be buying open banking player Finicity for $825 million. These two can really sort of be taken as a pair because what you're looking at is the big card providers positioning their pieces on the board to get ready for open banking, a world where they may no longer have a monopoly on the payment rails like they enjoy today, and uh, certainly not on the point of sale, which they realized they were already losing with things like Square and PayPal. So what they're trying to do is, is acquire the right uh, assets to be able to play in this open banking world. Then on February 24th, the same but different Intuit announced it would be buying fintech marketplace provider Credit Karma for $7.1 billion. Very similar to the card companies, Intuit is positioning themselves for open banking, but this time it's really about embracing and validating this notion of the marketplace model. That's something Starling in the UK has been validating for years. Uh, so even in a supposed laggard region like the US, uh, you see these very important moves taking place where, where they see the writing on the wall. They, they know we're headed towards some sort of common standard, some sort of marketplace model, and, and they're positioning themselves with very large, uh, frankly, acquisitions. Across the pond, on February 4th, French payment, payment uh, excuse me, French payments giant Worldline announced it would be buying rival Ingenico uh, for 8.6 billion, creating a massive global payments powerhouse. This is more a massing of the forces, this time in the payment space. Uh, and finally, even within the domain of open banking specialists, uh, you see consolidation happening as, as all these companies position themselves for, for the coming battle that they see uh, increasing in volume around the world. Notably, Scandinavian open banking success story Tink uh, Mar on March 27th announced live events, right? That's my dog running around upstairs. Sorry about that. Uh, notably, Scandinavian open banking success story Tink uh, announced on March 27th they would be purchasing Eurobits for um, uh, 18 million. And then very recently, just on July 16th, uh, they acquired credit decisioning provider uh, Instantor for another 4.2 million. So even within the domain of specialized open banking providers, you're seeing this consolidation as everybody lines up their pieces for the coming battle. So more uh, indications, this time on the, on the regulatory side. Uh, Brazil announces a standard very loudly with a very aggressive timeline. They want an implementation by November 2020. They're going to be publishing the standard uh, probably by the end of uh, the beginning, by the end of summer, and then an official one by October. So very aggressive time frame. They're very excited. Uh, to bring open banking to what is ultimately a very dynamic uh, neobank fintech market with, with massive adoption. Uh, we'll talk about that a little on the next slide. 
Uh, number two, Mexico licenses their very first fintech under their fintech law that they introduced back in uh, 2018. Um, an excellent standard. They really took the UK standard and extended it with some key capabilities. And uh, the other cool thing that Mexico is doing is they love crypto. They have a ton of cryptocurrency exchanges and their first license that they issued under the fintech law was in fact to a crypto a wallet provider. So they are now a bank, a crypto driven bank that Mexico was happy to give a license to. Uh, very interesting move um, from a regulated uh, region. Number three, UK, uh, OBIE, very much the darling of the open banking world, uh, launches the Open Banking App Store. I encourage those of you who have not seen it to go check it out. It is an amazing way to browse through the solutions uh, that providers have built on top of the open banking standards in the UK. Uh, if you are uh, at uh, companies where you're running into people who say, show me what this can do, show me some use cases, what, what is this really all about? Point them to the Open Banking App Store at the OBIE. It's a wonderful way to, to display what's possible. Uh, finally, number four, Australia CDR goes live. Uh, CDR, the consumer data right that everybody's been watching in Australia for ages because it's philosophically forward thinking, um, has officially gone live on July 1st. So we're going to see how this experiment goes of a, a multi-sector uh, standard that is really focused on consumers and their rights to their data as opposed to banking per se. Um, fascinating to, to continue to watch their progress. And finally, very, very recently, just four days ago, uh, the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, announced that it will leverage, this is going to sound boring, but I'll explain it, 10 Section 1033 of the Dodd-Frank Act to push for what they call, quote, consumer authorized access to financial data. Now, as boring as they tried to make it sound, the message was clear. They are getting behind uh, the lowercase O, lowercase B version of open banking and recognize the right for consumers to be able to share their financial data in secure ways based on what will ultimately be a standard. So even the US is starting to make moves towards essentially getting behind open banking and embracing open banking. And that just happened again, four days ago. So you can see this movement accelerating. Other events uh, notable that are really indicating the change in the banking ecosystem. Number one, Brazilian Decacorn, right? Unicorn times 10, uh, enjoys record-breaking growth over the last little period. Uh, they had 5 million users uh, in February of 2019, 15 million, so 10 million more. Uh, uh, what is that? 200% growth between February and October of last year. I know I promised I would uh, keep it to 2020, so let me do that. From October of last year, uh, they got to 20 million customers by January. So they added another 5 million in a quarter in three months. And so think about that for a second. Uh, that made them the largest uh, neo bank, largest digital only bank uh, outside of Asia by a mile. Uh, and this shows exactly how quickly the right digital offering can sweep through a region and really take over a market. Uh, incumbents out there take note of how quickly that can happen. And you want open banking in there to uh, be able to uh, ensure it happens in a controlled way. Looking at this, I actually want to switch number two and number three because we're talking about Brazil anyway. On the flip side of the rise of new bank in Brazil, uh, WhatsApp, uh, the second largest market for WhatsApp in the world is Brazil. And they recently tried to launch WhatsApp peer-to-peer -peer payments. The Brazilian cent central bank stepped in and suspended it. They said, nope, uh, not allowed because of competition. If WhatsApp wants to play here, they have to follow our upcoming open banking regulation. So they are in talks with uh, Facebook now to make sure that that happens. But what they cited uh, was competition. So if you look at that sort of combination of uh, events in Brazil, the rise of new bank and then the suspension of WhatsApp payments as they develop standards, it's uh, an enormously dynamic market right now and really a, a microcosm of open banking at large around the world. Let's go back to number two. Wirecard. <laughs> Wirecard is a, a, a German a payment and deposit provider who really completely imploded. Uh, what was the number in my notes? The 4 billion euros apparently just disappeared. Um, and it seems like the regulators were sort of uh, complicit or somehow involved. So it's a really ugly situation that highlighted the dangers of building out a fintech ecosystem, uh, even one that's regulated because Wirecard is a regulated entity without clear traceability, without clear uh, recourse, without clear... Um, uh, liability laws in place. So uh, really a, a wake-up call for uh, people who are very bullish about building out a fintech ecosystem without many controls. Um, number four, OBIE, again, uh, the darlings launched the Power of the Network, which is a campaign um, highlighting open banking providers that were aiding in the COVID-19 relief effort. Uh, 
wonderful campaign that demonstrated how open banking can be used for good, not just for uh, uh, the underbanked and, and, and so on, but in a crisis situation where you need your economy to pivot quickly and provide new services quickly, uh, open banking gives you the ability to do that. And that was demonstrated through the Power of the Network campaign. And finally, uh, number five, um, it's really a non-event, but worth mentioning, Canadians publish a paper. Uh, back in January, uh, the Canadian finance minister published a paper that was actually quite good. Unfortunately, it, it lacked serious teeth, didn't really set a timeline. And as a result, uh, Canada has recently hired uh, PwC to assist in the second round of consultation. So Canadians uh, continue, unfortunately, I say as a Canadian, uh, to lag, and the press has not been kind. I included them here as an event to show that you ignore this at your peril, right? It, it's happening all over the world. And if, if you keep pontificating and, and talking about it, uh, the rest of the world is gonna, is gonna come for you anyway. Um, not only has the Canadian press uh, been uh, roughly attacking the, the uh, finance minister incumbent banks about not making more progress, what you're seeing is fintechs, large and small, like GoPay and PayPal, trying to eat away at the edges and introduce ways to provide open banking functionality whether the large incumbents want it or not. And this really reinforces the fact that, sorry, my, my fellow Canadian bankers, open banking is not coming. Okay? It's not coming. It's here. And uh, the regions that ignore it uh, do so at their peril. Which brings me to my colleague, uh, Chris Michael, founder of Ozone API and head of technology at uh, uh, Open Banking UK. I had him as the first guest on the Mr. Open Banking podcast, and he dropped a marvelous quote. He said, at the end of the day, open banking is here now, and it's not going away. So really, the question remains, uh, what are you going to do about it? Right? It, it can no longer be ignored. Uh, thank you, in particular, to uh, my partners at Platformable, who provided all of the wonderful data, and, of course, uh, Axway, uh, who... Uh, really makes all of this possible, uh, the Mr. Open Banking podcast, um, and is going to be working with Platformable, Platformable to bring you the complete report um, in just a couple of weeks. So if you're interested in seeing the rest of the data and the, the whole state of the market report that shows you how open banking is, is going all over the world from several dimensions that I did not discuss today, I encourage you to keep an eye on axway.com and platformable.com. Uh, we'll be publishing that report uh, shortly. Um, if you enjoyed what you heard here today, I encourage you to uh, check out uh, uh, me at MrOpenBanking.com and, and the podcast and, and give it a listen, um, and I hope that you, uh, that you enjoy it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you, Ayal. Really, uh, we have more time for one quick question. Uh, uh, one question about the partnership between banks and fintechs uh, in APIs. Uh, it seems that they say the future is about partnering, but actually uh, it comes more about acquisition or competition more than let's say cooperation uh, do you see uh, that just it, do you think it's just a trend or now like the the honeymoon is over oh i think yeah okay uh we'll have a, a maybe that for another uh, another session and now um it's time uh oh yeah you know maybe just answering that question al Sorry, I, I think I hit a button I wasn't supposed to hit. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you yeah, hear okay. the question? Uh, yes, I, I did hear the question. Sorry about uh, logging off. So um, I did highlight some major acquisitions. I think yeah. uh, that's an indication that this is getting serious, right? It's very easy to say partner and you saw, uh, you know, large banks, they left a token partner and so on. But when they start acquiring companies, um, it shows that they're very serious about this, uh, uh, let's say, honeymoon period, as you put it, somewhat being over. Um, that said, look, uh, there were some, some items I had to keep off the list. Um, you saw uh, one instance where a lending club, for example, in the US acquired a bank just for their charter. So you're starting to see the open banking players and the fintechs become large enough that uh, they are making the, the acquisition moves. So I think um, this is just a symptom of the growth in the market and the growth and the opportunity that we are beyond this sort of uh, loosey-goosey let's partner and, and we're talking real deals, real black brass tacks, real API products as everyone moves to to really monetize and, and capture a chunk of the market, right? Uh, the British invasion of the neobanks into the U.S. is another example. Yeah, thank you very much for answering that question. It seems like banks wants to be fintechs and fintechs wants to be banks, and they will, they will, they'll meet at the EPI level, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And the thing that we, that we should not forget is this ever-important question of trust, right? The fact is, 
even though banks are a little confused and oftentimes uh, scared of, of these fintechs coming for them, um, they have amassed a great deal of a very important currency, uh, which is trust. And if they figure out a good way to leverage that, um, I, I think there's a bright future for at least some of them. Yeah, thank you, Ayal. Thank you very much for answering that question. And now uh, we're a little bit, few minutes late, but we have, uh, we are glad to have a Matthew Renbold that will come on stage. Thank you, Ayal. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Betty. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.